Hello everyone and welcome to the Edward Little Library read aloud of Two Can Keep a Secret by Karen M. McManus, read with permission from Random House Children's Books. So today um, it's Wednesday, we're on chapter 13, but we will recap a little bit about what happened in chapter 12. Uh, Ellery and Ezra are in the middle of FaceTiming with Sadie, their mom, um, while they wait for a ride uh, from Officer Rodriguez to Fright Farm for the pep rally. Um, the twins are hesitant about telling Sadie any of the information that's happening in town right now because the rehab facility where Sadie is at has said to just kind of skim the surface about things and don't really um, get into too much serious stuff when interacting with her. Um, but Sadie, of course, pushes and she calls Malcolm a cute vandal and Ellery gets kind of angry at that and so she, Ellery begins to push back at, at her mom and she starts asking Sadie all kinds of questions about her own homecoming dance. Um, Sadie, of course, is really hesitant to tell the kids anything about um, the dance when she was younger, but with a lot of prodding, she begins to tell them a few things and she tells them that her date was Vance Puckett. Um, Ellery then uh, continues on kind of uh, egging her on and she asks who Sarah went with and that's when um, Sadie just closes up completely. Uh, she looks behind her um, and she pretends that someone's telling her to get off the phone um, but the kids know that that's not true but they end the, co the call and uh, she gets off the hook without answering any of those questions about Sarah. Meanwhile, Officer Rodriguez arrives to take the kids to Fright Farm for the pep rally. Of course, Nana has asked that Officer Rodriguez do this, knowing that all of the stuff that has been happening in town. Um, now, while they drive, Ellery mentions that Daisy's back in town, and so is Declan, and she kind of looks and waits for a reaction from Officer Rodriguez. She doesn't get much when she um, mentions that Daisy's back in town, but she definitely gets some kind of reaction when she mentions Declan's back in town. And that's when Officer Rodriguez closes her off uh, by telling her that he needs to listen to some police radio so to, um, to just kind of be quiet. So um, Ellery strikes out there too, and I think at the end of the chapter, Ezra says something to her like, well, you're 0 for 2 or something like that. So that's the end of chapter 12. Uh, we start here um, on chapter 13 which is narrated by Ellery with the date, Friday, September 27th. Officer Rodriguez walks with us to the far end of the park, past the demon roller coaster with its blood red waterfall and the entrance to the dark witch maze. Two girls giggle nervously as a masked attendant hands them each a flashlight. You'll need these to navigate the pitch black lair you're about to experience, he intones, but be careful along your journey Fear awaits the further you go. One of the girls examines her flashlight, then shines it on the thatched wall of the maze. These are going to shut off right when we need them, aren't they? She asks. Fear awaits the further you go, the attendant repeats, stepping to one side. A clawed hand shoots out of the wall and makes a grab for the nearest girl, who shrieks and falls back against her friend. Gets them every time. Officer Rodriguez says, lifting the flap to one of the bloody big top tents. Here's where I leave you guys. Good luck finding seats. The bleachers, ringing a circular stage, are packed. But as Ezra and I scan the crowd, we spot Mia waving energetically. About time, she says when we reach her. It's been hell holding these seats. She stands, picking her coat up from the bench beside her and Ezra glances down at a small concession stand set up to the left of the stage. I'm going to get a drink. You guys want anything? No, I'm good, I say, and Mia shakes her head. Ezra thuds down the stairs as I squeeze past Mia in the too small space. It's not until I sit down that I notice the flash of red hair beside me. You certainly like to cut it close, Viv says. She's in a green corduroy jacket and jeans, a gauzy yellow scarf looped around her neck. Two other girls sit beside her, each holding steaming styrofoam cups. I look at her and then at the stage, where Katrin, Brooke, and the other cheerleaders are lining up. 
and I thought you were a cheerleader. I say confused. Mia fake coughs. <coughs> Sore point, as Viz Viv stiffens. I don't have time for cheerleading. I run the school newspaper. A note of pride creeps into her voice as she gestures toward the aisle in the front of the stage where a man is setting up an oversized camera. A Channel 5 in Burlington is covering the vandalism story based on my article. They're getting local color. I lean forward, intrigued despite myself. The school's letting them? You can't stop the free press, Viv says smugly. She points toward a striking dark-haired woman standing next to the camera, microphone dangling from one hand. That's Melly Dinglassa. She graduated from Echo Ridge ten years ago and went to Columbia's journalism school. She says it almost reverently, twisting her scarf until it's even more artfully draped. Her outfit would look incredible on TV, which I'm starting to think is the point. I'm applying their early decision. I'm hoping she'll give me a reference. On my other side, Mia plucks up my sleeve. The band's about to start, she says. Ezra returns just in time, a bottled water in one hand. I tear my eyes away from the reporter as dozens of students holding instruments file through the back entrance and array themselves across the stage. I'd been expecting traditional marching band uniforms but they're all in black athletic pants and purple t-shirts that read Echo Ridge High across the front in white lettering. Malcolm's in the first row, a set of snare drums draped around his neck. Percy Gilpin jogs onto the stage in the same purple blazer he wore to the assembly last week and bounds up to a makeshift podium. He adjusts the microphone and raises both hands in the air as people in the stands start to clap. Good evening, Echo Ridge! Are you ready for some serious fall fun? We've got a big night planned to support the Echo Ridge Eagles, who are undefeated, heading into tomorrow's game against Soulsbury High. More cheers from the crowd as Mia executes a slow clap beside me. Yay. Let's get this party started, Percy yells. The cheerleaders take center stage in a V formation their purple and white pom-poms planted firmly on their hips. A small girl steps out from the band's brass section, squinting against the bright overhead lights. Percy blows a whistle, and the girl brings a trombone to her lips. When the first few notes of Paradise City blare out, Ezra and I lean across Mia to exchange surprised grins. Sadie is a Guns N' Roses fanatic, and we grew up with this song blasting through whatever apartment we were living in. An LED screen at the back of the stage starts flashing football game highlights, and within seconds, the entire crowd is on its feet. About halfway through, as everything's building to a crescendo, the other drummers stop, and Malcolm launches into this fantastic, frenetic solo. His drumsticks move impossibly fast, the muscles in his arms tense with effort, and my hand half lifts to fan myself before I realize what I'm doing. The cheerleaders are in perfect rhythm with the beat, executing a crisp, high-energy routine that ends with Brooke being tossed into the air, ponytail flying, caught by waiting hands, just as the song ends, and the entire band takes a bow as one. I'm clapping so hard my palms hurt as Mia catches my eye and grins. I know, right? She says. I lose all my cynicism when the band performs. It's Echo Ridge's uniting force. I accidentally knock into Viv when I sit back down, and she shifts away with a grimace. There's not enough room on this bench, she says sharply, turning to her friends. I think we might see better farther down. Bonus, Mia murmurs as the three of them file out of our row. We scared Viv away. A few minutes later, a shadow falls across, across Viv's vacated seat. I glance up to see Malcolm in his purple Echo Ridge High t-shirt minus the drums. Hey, he says, room for one more? His hair is tussled and his cheeks flushed and he looks really, really cute. Yeah, of course, I shift closer to Mia. You are great, I add, and he smiles. One of his front teeth is slightly crooked and it softens the moody look he usually has. 
I just gestured toward the stage where Coach Gagnon is talking passionately about tradition and giving your all. Photos are still looping on the LED screen behind him. Will you play an encore? Nah, we're done for the night. It's football talk time. We listen for a few minutes to the coach's speech. It's getting repetitive. What happened six years ago? I ask. He keeps bringing it up. State championship, Malcolm says. Echo Ridge won when Declan was a junior. And then I remember the yearbook from the library, filled with pictures of the team's huge come-from-behind victory against a much bigger school, and Declan Kelly being carried on his teammates' shoulders afterward. Oh, that's right, I say. Your brother threw a Hail Mary touchdown with seconds left in the game, didn't he? It's a little weird, maybe, how perfectly I remember a game I never attended. But Malcolm just nods. That must have been amazing. Something like reluctant pride flits across Malcolm's face. I guess. Uh, Declan was bragging for weeks that he was going to win that game. People laughed, but he backed it up. He runs a hand through his sweat-dampened hair. It shouldn't be attractive, the way his hair spikes up afterward in uneven tufts, but it is. He always did. I can't tell if it's my own nagging suspicions of Declan that make Malcolm's words sound om ominous. Were you guys close? I ask. As soon as the words are out of my mouth, I realize I've made it sound as though Declan is dead. Are you close? I amend. No, Malcolm says, leaning forward with his elbows on his knees. His voice is quiet, his eyes on the stage. Not then, and not now. Every once in a while, it feels like Malcolm and I are having some kind of sub-conversation that we don't acknowledge. We're talking about football and his brother, supposedly, but we're also talking about before and after. It's how I think about Sadie, that she was one way before the kind of loss that rips your world apart, and a different version of herself afterward. Even though I didn't know her until after Sarah was gone, I'm sure it's true. I want to ask Malcolm more, but before I can, Mia reaches across me and punches him in the arm. Hey, she says, did you do the thing? No, Malcolm says, avoiding Mia's gaze. She glances between us and smirks, and I get the distinct feeling that I'm missing something. And let's not forget, after we defeat Soulsbury tomorrow, and we will, we've got our biggest test of the season with the homecoming game next week, Coach Ganyon says between his perfectly bald head and the shadows cast by the big top stadium lighting he looks like an exceptionally enthusiastic alien we're up against lutheran our only defeat last year but that's not going to happen this time around because this time a loud popping noise fills my ears making me jump the bright lights snap off and the led screen goes black then flashes to life again static fills the screen followed by a photo of Lacey in her homecoming crown, smiling at the camera. The crowd gasps, and Malcolm goes rigid beside me. Then Lacey's picture rips in two, replaced by three others, Brooke, Katrin, and me. Theirs are class photos, but mine is a candid, with my face half turned from the camera. A chill inches up my spine as I recognize the hoodie I wore yesterday when Ezra and I walked downtown to meet Malcolm and Mia at Bartley's. Somebody was watching us, following us. Horror movie laughter starts spilling from the speakers, literal muhahas that echo through the tent as what looks like thick red liquid drips down the screen, followed by jagged white letters, soon. When it fades away, the bloody big top is utterly silent. Everyone is frozen, with one exception, Melly Dinglasa from Channel 5. She strides purposefully onto the stage toward Coach Gagnon with her microphone outstretched and a cameraman at her heels. Woo, and that is the end of Chapter 13. We will continue right here on Chapter 14 tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock uh, on the YouTube channel. 
um, which I linked yesterday, again, back to on Facebook and Instagram, so you should be able to find it. Uh, thank you for listening in today, and I hope you can join us again tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone.